Welcome to Artful Design Television. Uh, we are online and we are in quarantine. As always, you can find us at artful.design slash TV. That's the good place to go and uh, join this broadcast every time because Zoom URLs and other things may change. And I'm your host, Go Wong, and this is also co-organized with Karma PhD student Kung Wu Kim. Hey, Kung Wu, you want to say hi? Hello, I'm Kung Wu. Um, I'm a PhD student in Karma, studying with Go, and I'm your co-host. Thank you, Kung Wu. Um, so, you're here, and so what is this all about? So this is a multi-format weekly series encompassing artful design, music, coding, some critical making with helpings of history and philosophy, and life check-ins for participants. Just a, you know, nothing else, a, a time and a space for us to gather. Um, and to, and this should be a, it, it is a safe place for us to, to, to feel like we can really stay connected as much as we can, given the current, the pre present circumstances. No experience needed, it's, and it's welcome for all. And we'll, we'll explore a topic, have a conversation. Our special guest today is Hannah Shin, Stanford uh, Masters of Music Science and Technology, class of 2015. We'll be talking about music and design with her. And uh, we're gonna attempt a few collaborative activities. We're gonna start really, really simple and uh, we're gonna keep it simple so we can all participate. Um, and even if you don't write code, the group audio programming will be designed so that we can all weigh in on what, what do we want it to sound like? We all have kind of a, something of a, of a preference that I think to be expressed. So that's kind of the collaboration, the collaborative coding, maybe one or two people might be coding, but all of us can be weighing in. And we're not gonna do any coding today given this is the first episode because that just seems extra like a bad idea, but um, we're gonna try that as early as next week. What could go wrong? And on that note, I will say this is an experiment. It's a social experiment. It's, a, it's, a, it's just an experiment. Um, and that we don't know how this is going, but we're going to make the best of it. And we do have a plan, but we also really will count on all of us to figure out how to make this work. There is a feedback, uh, a place for feedback on the website. I'll point to that at the end, where after each episode, please give us your honest and critical feedback and how we can improve this, because we're interested in, in this as a very key part of design. And all of this is, of course, design in motion. So... The first segment, let's just do a really quick check-in. And for this, actually, the way we're gonna do this, <coughs> excuse me, we've already started this. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing. And um, here, now that we have participants here, let's all make sure we can familiarize ourselves with the Zoom interface. So if everyone goes to the bottom, and again, there's two things that are typically useful. One is the participants list. If you click on that, we can see a list of participants. And we'll, we'll go slow here. And now there's a way on here to actually interact. Um, for one, you can actually raise your hands or clap or thumbs down, thumbs up, go fast, go slow. So this is what we do. Let's everyone raise our hands. Very nice. Okay, I know some of you may be on the web or another, inter another device that would not allow you to get to this interface. Totally, totally good. Um, and uh, let's see, next, let's go to chat. And for this part of the check-in, I think this might be a good point for us to um, type something that, type how you're feeling today. And you can be as honest as you want. Um, try to make this a, this is a safe place. Um, or something you're, you're worried about. Yeah, this is like that project, I Feel Fine, where you, we basically, they basically scraped social media follow for words that follow the phrase, I feel. And this is kind of how we feel. I see happy, I see tired, I see worried, I see excited, I see hungry. Up and down, yeah, I think we all feel maybe a little bit of all of these things. And some of us feel a lot. So, all right, so thank you very much. This is really also a test. And by the way, um, while just because we have so many participants in here, we're gonna keep everyone muted until, unless there's specific moments where we recognize people to, to, to say things verbally, but everyone is always welcome to type in chat, uh, even when others are talking. I think this can be like 
just a regular stream where people can just <coughs> voice voice their thoughts. And so, um, thank you, Matt. By the way, Matt Wright, our uh, technical director at Karma, is grateful for the everybody is muted protocol. Um, this, of course, is to keep down background noise for everyone so everyone can have an experience. And if you do have something to say, you might could raise your hand and then we'll do our best to uh, to recognize. And of course, we're just still figuring this out. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, I, I guess one thing I will do as a check-in is I'm going to tell you about this, uh, this, this, this set of uh, proverbs or whatever that's behind me written in Chinese. Uh, this has gone in a ch market in Beijing um, like six years ago. But I want to tell you what it says, right? Uh, in Chinese, this would be pronounced Chan Zao Lin Yu Jin. Niao Ming Shan Geng Yu. So it's actually read from the top right and it goes down. And then there's a second part that goes here. Now, what does that say? Well, that is the word for cicada. And it's saying in the forest, the, the, the cicadas ring out and echo out. And it's so quiet that the sound of cicadas only enhance the calm and, and the quiet. The second one says, well, that's the symbol for bird. And that the birds chirping, singing, songing in the mountain actually makes everything even more serene. In a sense, this is a, well, this has gone because, partly because it's actually both sonic and me being a computer music person, that seemed like a thing. Um, but also, it's a state of mind. And I think it's a state of mind that's, I think, very strangely apropos for this time in which we find ourselves, in which we're all quarantined. We're kind of in our own quarters. And I think this is a statement about solitude, uh, but not the bad kind, but a, the good side, in which we can, in some sense, learn to live in solitude. And this is a statement about serenity and about kind of finding not an absolute silence, but a kind of calm within the sparse sounds of the world. And certainly these days, it seems like we're actually hearing birds chirp more. Um, so this is something I would like to invite all of you to, to think about. Uh, maybe this is one thing that you, if you like, you can take away from this. It's the notion, hey, well, we may not be in a forest or mountain, but the state of mind is here for us to inhabit. And, and it's so quiet that the cicadas ring out and the bird singing just makes everything that much more calm and serene. So with that, um, we will continue and uh, we'll come back to this question of calm. Um, so um, Next thing is, before we get to the short lecture of the day, let's do a group activity, right? And I'm going to switch this back into uh, gallery view. And in this group activity, I want us all to kind of, in our own ways, find ways to, uh, to move along to some music. And this is what I would call a 30-second group dance. I have no idea how this is going to work, but let's try it. And what are we going to dance to? We're going to dance to none other than this. Remember this? Yeah. All right, cool. Here we go. On the drop, everyone. Thank you all very much. Great job. That totally worked better than we than I thought. You guys are awesome. I hope that feels good. I think there's something that we can still do through just synchronized, sonic-mediated kind of physical motion. Even when we can't be in the same physical space, uh, I think there's something embodying when we actually move our bodies. So um, 
we'll, we're going to do that again, maybe uh, later today, and maybe maybe we'll do that at the top of uh, the next week. So let's take that feeling, and now let's go to the next segment of Artful Design TV, episode one. Let me see where are my slides at. There it is. And it is a segment called Thinking About Stuff. Now, this is the time to kind of grab grab a drink, grab a snack, and uh, and <laughs> excuse me. And I'm going to talk about stuff and uh, and ask some questions for all of us to think together on this. And this is regarding artful design, and it's also going to relate to kind of our current situation. But let's start about design. And really, this is kind of an overarching question for not just today, but maybe this entire series. And it's this big question, you know, why do we design? Why do we make things? And this can be interpreted as broadly as you'd like, but I think that is kind of an, a broad question, a critical question for us to ask. And we're to look at design, for example, as an act of alignment and calibration of our tools to our way of life. Well, what do we make of that, right? For example, I think our way of life in the last few weeks has completely changed. And therefore our tools, they have not changed as quickly in this case, but we have a different context with which to actually view our tools. And the calibration is actually needed. Suddenly, a lot of tools that were useful cannot be used right now. On the other hand, there's a lot of tools that, that we, didn't, we thought were novel, but really not necessarily practical, suddenly become almost indispensable. For example, all manners of video conferencing software suddenly is now just something we, we kind of need. So there's a lot of kind of calibration to this, right? And alongside these questions are other questions. You know, what does it mean to design well? And really, anytime you have a choice, I think we have to ask this question, what does it mean to design ethically? And all of this is going into this big question, why do we design? And ultimately in this series, Artful Design Television, we wanna ask what makes design artful? So just to give you a bit of context for those of you who might not know uh, me or Kung Wu or kind of karma of where, kind of where we work, well, this is Stanford during different times because we can see there's a lot of people down there and they in social distancing. Excuse me. Now, we work in uh, Karma, which is under those chimneys behind Memorial Church in the background. And uh, we see now Roman, uh, one of our illustrious uh, doctorate alums, um, actually walking alongside Karma. And that's Stanford Center for Computer Research and Music and Acoustics, CCRMA, that is pronounced Karma. Um, that's me in my office, obviously not right now. This is also before all of this happened. But uh, I've been at Stanford since 2007, and that's kind of been my, kind of my home uh, while on campus. Now, I make things. Our research group makes things. We make things critically in the sense that we build things and that embody ideas, arguments, sentiments, um, but at the same time, you know, really is there to serve an established purpose, but we think very critically about that purpose and the way we design things. We design tools, toys, games, musical instruments, social experiences, virtual reality. We write a lot of code. We make tools like programming languages for music. And this is gonna be the tool that we're gonna be using in, in a few weeks time to, uh, to be writing code together uh, in this collaborative effort. And there's the Laptop Orchestra. This is Slork, the Stanford Laptop Orchestra. We'll be getting into that as well. And uh, apps, um, and as well as the Karma VR Lab in which we ask the questions, how do we make music together in VR? What does it mean to make music together? You know, what is real? In some sense, you know, VR is, is kind of, <laughs> suddenly seems to take on a different dimension here as all our meetings are conducted virtually, that our classes are taught virtually, business, life, gatherings are all, all virtual. So in some sense, these questions have not changed, but the context have. Um, and of course, I put all this into a book, the namesake of this, of this series, and it really asks all these questions, what makes design artful? Why do we design? For example, um, I can't believe I'm still demoing this after 12 years after designing this in 2008, but this is the Smule Ocarina. 
I turn on uh, original sound. Okay, so it's an app on the phone. You probably, some of you may have heard me play this. Some of you may have heard me play this a lot, but. You blow into the phone to make music. And so on the screen, there are these finger holes and I'm blowing into the microphone at the bottom of this iPhone. And you actually see things respond as they, um, uh, as I actually in interact with this. So I can keep going, um, and, um, and so that's uh, that's Ocarina, and if we look at the design of Ocarina, right, and actually put it through this filter of why this thing was uh, was designed, and let me go back to screen sharing here. Design not complicated, um, and uh, you blow into the phone. The, you don't actually see the ocarina, you just see the functional parts of an ocarina that you can interact with. The green waves visualize kind of the breath as you're blown into the phone. And this is all to make kind of an argument through design to say that, hey, what you're interacting with is not emulating an ocarina. What you're interacting with is in fact, is the, is the, is the artifact, is the thing. It is an ocarina. It's kind of an ontological statement, if you will, that this is not the facsimile, this is the thing. And it's a physical thing, right? And, and, and so in, in that, it's also an embodied thing, that the sound comes from the artifact. It comes from the thing that you're holding, like a sandwich in front of you, and, and you're blowing into. So, and this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. Where you're prompted as to how to play the next note. But you are actually free to choose how you actually render these passages. How long you want to hold a note, how you want to express or co-articulate notes. It's all, it's all there. And, uh, and in a sense, it's kind of like Guitar Hero or like Ocarina Hero, but in a way, it's different in the sense that there is an intentioned design to support a kind of open expressiveness. But here's the question, why was this designed? I would like to point out that this is a thing like that nobody asked for, right? I mean, literally nobody asked for this and it really solved no problems that exist. Think about it, right? Like it was like, hey people, what do you need? We need to build an app. People are like, well, uh, we need to blow into our phones to make music. Nobody asked for this. And it solved no, at least no practical problem that I can think of. So, uh, that's Ocarina, and, and, it's, and by definition, it's useless. I'll put quotes around this because I think this is a very interesting term, usefulness, utility, uselessness, right? And, but it, it's very much to do with this one way we can look at why do we design things. And so this brings us to kind of the critical question of the day, which is why do we design useless things, quote unquote, right? Why do we do this? Um, so, to give you some examples of other, perhaps, useless things, let's look at unnecessary inventions. And this is by one Matt Benedetto, who has taken it upon himself to design things. For example, these croc, Crocs gloves, baguette, a pack pack for your baguette, uh, a, piece of fan, fan, a pizza fanny pack, a ringer's comb, Utility nails, like, is this useful? I mean, these are tools, so it's got to be useful, but, like, is that useful? Is that useless? I don't know. Personal rear view mirror. The personal spacinator. By the way, this was pre-COVID-19 design, right? So, like, now, like, if you were to design this, this suddenly is, is not so unnecessary. Like, there are, I've actually, I've seen photos of people made physical contraptions with a six-feet radius, right? But this, uh, you know, this is this is actually was done like two a few years ago, so they couldn't have known that this is going to be the thing. But hey, there we here we are. 
a taco feeder? Are these necessary inventions? I don't know. Finger extender? Perhaps not. Portable cereal bowl? Here's something. You can take your AirPods, which if you're worried about losing, or if you just want to emulate the good old feeling of having like wired head, you know, earbuds, you can actually use his invention, which is like a 3D printed holder for your AirPods with like a fake cable that you can wear just like normal wired earpods, right? So that's, there you go. A curtain for secret eating. Think of the use cases for these things, right? They're really hilariously specific. This reminds me of another inventor, designer, cartoonist, Keith Robinson, who decades ago drew these elaborate, artful, overly, intentionally overly complicated like ways of living. You know, this, for example, is a banquet hall designed for a, a basically having not much room at all, but having a lot of guests for a wedding. Think about that. And this is another kind of a kind of you know, kind of making the most of your spaces kind of a situation. This is a rocker for your infant, but also, I guess, an exercise machine as well. And finally, not least, we have Simone Yetch, the internet's self-proclaimed queen of shitty robots, right? And she is fantastic. Find her on YouTube. She is such a, just a delightful personality. And she builds things. She designs things. And she designs things like this. Let's pause here. This was a six second video. And this is kind of video that really put her on the map some years ago, right? And she, why did she design this? But before we ask and try to answer that question, let's examine and critically break down this particular um, six second video. So yeah, this thing is has a purpose, is to apply lipstick, but look at the context. Her hair is done. She's dressed up. She's reading her morning iPad, maybe presumably ready to go to work, whatever that means. And here's this robot that she's hardly noticing that's just applying lipstick in a hilariously bad way. What is this saying, right? What does this tell us? And what does this ask of us about the way we design? One thing I might note is that, you know, this this is a commentary perhaps on our technology, but in a way that is both kind of critical uh, of and really um, skeptical of our technology, but in another way, it's really loving if you think about it. This is not something that just categorically condemns technology, nor is the one that categorically says this is all good, but it's saying it's complicated when technology is, is in the midst of life, because life is complicated, right? So this is, I think the second video actually says a lot more than, than maybe if what might at first meets the eye. Is this a useless thing? Yes and no, right? It's useful in that it has a purpose. It's useless in that it does its purpose really poorly, but at the same time, the poorness with which it does its job because it's intentional serves yet a different purpose. Let's get our head around that, right? So, back to this question, why do we design? I think that's a good question. You know, is it from necessity? And is necessity always that which gives rise to invention? So for the next part, let's actually take this question and look at a different way of, of addressing. Why do we design also? Why do we design useless things? And let's look at a very useful thing. Something that I think we would all agree is quite useful, and that is the toilet. Yes, and this is a thing that represents a human need that is about as universal as they come. If food, if eating is input, then this is output, right? This is something that we, every one of us, have maybe our needs are different regarding the toilet, but we all have this general need right, as much as we have the need to actually eat in order to sustain ourselves. So this thing clearly is here to design to speak to a certain need, and it of course speaks to this, this proverb that necessity is the mother of invention. You have an, a, an established aim, and you go about addressing that aim, and thereby you are, well, designing and engineering. And of course, the toilets is more than just 
a single toilet, the form varies depending on cultural and practical contexts, right? It's also historical. Of course, if you think about it, as long as there's been kind of civilization as, as we think of it, there's been toilets. Here's a kind of a toilet from the Greco-Roman ancient world. Here's a uh, kind of a, a replica of a Roman latrine. If you wonder how people use this in case it's not self-explanatory, a museum will tell you in this wax figure of someone going to do their business on such a latrine. This is the royal stool box of King Henry VIII. Let's consider this design. But let's consider who sits on this particular design. And in fact, who sat on this was none other than King Henry VIII. But the really interesting thing about this was actually a, a, a person that, that stood next to him. And that person had this title, Groomsman of the Stool, whose actual job was to clean the rather capacious bottom of King Henry VIII, because the king's physical form was considered divinity. And this kind of task could not be undertaken by just any random person. You had to be at least an earl or a duke to be the groomsman. This job, however unpleasant on paper, was genuinely coveted as a position, for much court and political information was divulged informally by the king as he sat on his royal toilet, which often took quite some time for, quite famously, Henry VIII, especially towards the latter parts of his life, ate almost exclusively meat, and who actually needed semi-regular enemas and therefore really, you know, typically had to take his time on the toilet. So the groomsman really got the uh, inside scoop, as it were, on a, you know, on, on juicy court intrigue. So here's design being more than just the design, right? But there's, some, there's historical context that's in here. And then, then here's some designs of toilets that's kind of the not my problem kind of design. Let's just consider that. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but this, of course, speaks to the need for beyond just the toilet. You need to design how to dispose of the waste that's got to collect somewhere under, under it to the modern toilet, <coughs> which includes things like inventions like the U-Bend, which was invented by one Thomas Crapper, which actually has nothing to do, like that's not where, this, where the term crap comes from. This actually also speaks to the age-old adage, nomen is omen, right? Nomen, like your name, like nomenclature, is omen. It kind of signifies or maybe is a, a, a prognosis of kind of, uh, of your fate. Nomen is omen. Two toilets in art. Not just any art, but this, of course, is the art that kind of broke art, right? And uh, in fact, this was voted the most influential artwork of the 20th century by... 500 British art professionals beating out Picasso and Warhol. The Independent noted that in the single work, conceptual art was invented, forever severing the traditional link between the artist's labor and the merit of the work. Toilet, transcending the practical dimensions of a toilet. If you take a urinal, you turn it sideways, put it on a pedestal, place it in a museum, put a placard next to it, and call it art. Is it art? But that very question is part of the art. And once you start asking that question, you can't entirely deny that this is art because it got you to think, to consider, to actually think about this thing that is so everyday, so universal, can be something so exotic, so interesting. If only it makes you consider the very definition of art itself, right? So there's toilet. In fact, that's not the only famous toilet art in history. This is a piece in 2016 named America. You might have seen or heard of this piece. Some of you may have even used this piece. This is a functioning toilet made out of $4 million worth of gold. In the museum in which this was housed, more than 100,000 people have used this with a security guard positioned outside the door to make sure, you know, this is not taken. Though I believe currently this thing's actually stolen and missing. Um, though I could be out of date on that. But nonetheless, the artist, whatever you eat, a $200 lunch or a $2 hot dog, the results are the same toilet-wise. Wow, check that out. 
And yes, this is the same toilet that was offered to the Trump White House. Right? This, there's something, there's commentary, political, uh, life, and also just, you know, there's something very equalizing about the toilet. Uh, and the irony, of course, in this case, is that it was a toilet for such a, such a, a task we'd rather not think too heavily about, made out of a $4 million worth of, uh, of raw material. And this is all to say, design is more than design. It's more than the thing that's been designed. Look at the toilet. Human necessity gave rise to invention, but it's not standalone. It's generated new necessities and further inventions like the U-Bend, sewage system, sanitation works, administration, and industry. And, uh, and the toilet's invention has taken on diverse forms, influenced by civic, technological, social, cultural, and even political contexts. These are the hidden layers and the meaning of the design of toilets, and in fact, I would say the design of everything. It's always context. Design is nothing if not context. So, taking yet, flipping this on its head one more time to really critically consider this question we began with, why do we design? Why do we design useless things? What if we flip the two? Invention is the mother of necessity. Reverse the roles. Is there truth in this statement? This, by the way, is Melvin Kranzberg's a technology, a technology historian his second law of technology. His first law of technology, which we'll come back to in a future episode, states that uh, technology is neither good, nor is it bad, nor is it neutral, right? And so this is a second law, and let's think about that. What are some examples of invention giving rise to necessity? Well, the aforementioned kind of, well, the smartphone, right? We might find that we really need this now, but that need, did not precede the invention. You know, before the iPhone, before the Nokia N95, before kind of really apps, like we didn't know we need this thing, therefore we didn't. But this was invented, and now, especially now, as we sit needing connection and needing communication more than ever, this is something that, that is a necessity that wasn't, say, 20 years ago. And if you look back 50 years ago, there was no really no mobile phone to speak of, right? Um, same with things like Twitter. Like, who knew we needed, like, a microblogging thing where we can just share our thoughts 280 characters at a time? Um, well, before, like, 2006, 2007, like, not many people. Right after that, a lot of people. Hmm. Has it become a need? Things like DoorDash, which, of course, is something that certainly we find ourselves potentially needing more in, during this time. And this thing, perhaps, we find ourselves needing less now, but maybe we never really needed this. I don't know, but this is kind of a WTF moment. Of This is like DoorDash for gasoline, where they basically have like someone pull up in a mini tanker of gasoline and fill up your car wherever you want it to. Hmm. The irony of this, of course, this is expending like gasoline to drive who knows how far to actually go to your car to fuel your car. We have to really think about kind of the, the ethical and other ramifications of this, of this particular service, but you know, there it is. Um, and in a way, like so much of our design is motivated by convenience and that so much so that, well, Oscar Wilde once said, we live in an age where unnecessary things are our only necessity, right? Think, think like that. I mean, I mean, think about that. It's uh, There's some truth in all of this. So yeah, invention, as much as necessity is the, the mother invention, the reverse may also be true. A second way that Kranzberg actually thought of this particular law, actually, and the, the one that's more faithful to Kranzberg's original thinking, is that inventions, uh, after they entrench themselves in life, actually needs more things to be invented. They necessitate further necessities for invention. For example, let's take the Parthenon, right? We look at the Parthenon to this day as kind of an, like an ancient marvel of, of architecture, and we think about the design of the building, its construction. But for that to happen, a lot of other things had, had to have happened. There had to be 50,000 cubic feet of quarried marble that had to be quarried by skilled and unskilled labor. That had to be, and this was very tricky in the ancient world, transported to this built site. Like this 
was so important that actually, in fact, the single most expensive cost of building the Parthenon was its transportation, not the Parthenon itself, not not the construction. It's actually just moving these large single sections, column sections, intact into actually even before there are column sections, they're actually moved as slightly larger blocks of quarried marble. And that had been ingeniously transported before they get the build site, and then they're crafted into these column sections. So yeah, this there are entire industries that come to online because of new inventions, because they need to new even newer inventions to support those inventions. Indeed there is more than meets the eye when it comes to design. This is just the one of many ways. And this, in fact, that is what we're here to explore in our design television. And back to this question. So back to Walk Arena, right? The useless thing that nobody asks for, that, that serves no need, that exists. Uh, there's another dimension, and that's a social dimension. We can listen to other people blow into their phones from around the world. It's an anonymous social network based on music. You don't know who, who that is, and that's kind of the point. I mean, the idea is that, well, not knowing this case might be a virtue because it makes you wonder. And just because you know, does that actually make the interaction more meaningful? In this case, I think Ocarina argues that in, in this specific case, it does not. So this, the anonymity was something to really design around. And the idea is not to necessarily communicate, but a sense to give a sense of, of connection. And that is kind of maybe a different kind of need, right? And if there's underlying philosophy behind this part of Ocarina is that technology should create calm. And again, I'll draw my draw our attention back to the, uh, the Chinese poem that's kind of behind me, even though you can't see that right now on the screen. Calm, right? From Ocarina News in 2009, this is my peace on earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq, and hell on earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Calm. So, in a way, Ocarina did nothing practical for this person. Did not plug them from whatever hell they found themselves in, but for a moment, it helped them to transcend it, right? In a way, that's, maybe this is to say, good design does speak, address a purpose, a very clear practical purpose, and that enables us. But great design does that, and in a way, that makes us feel understood. Like art, like your favorite song, your favorite movie, your favorite people your favorite interactions. Perhaps they're your favorite I offer because you feel they really get you as a person, as who you are, but also they get us as people, right? And I think this is the question, again, of, of what it means for design to be artful. And for me, that's one of the ways that I like to think about it is, is design that understands us. So um, one more design. And this is from our co-organizer and co-host, Kung Wu. And I'm, we're going to have Kung Wu and also the rest of our VR lab back for a future episode. But this is Kung Wu's MIDI city. I'm just going to give you a short preview of it. This is a city that's interactive. It's musical. You can turn buildings on. And also, you can scale the amount of light in these buildings. And this turns up the density of an algorithmic music process that's being generated. And this is done in Trinity, combining the Chuck programming language with unity. Turning the Ferris wheel changes the tempo of the entire system. And there's a certain peace when I just kind of behold this thing. And things really get going. <coughs> and the music starts to really get going. And then we go to the moon. On the moon, there are rabbits. Well, I'll leave it to come in a future episode to explain why there are rabbits on the moon, but there are rabbits. And these rabbits are making, I guess, rice cakes. And trains come out. And they flow through the city. 
Yeah, I don't know about you, but... Even in quarantine, this is a city I would not mind being part of or to visit. UFOs come out of the sky? They're not here to do any harm, they're here just to play music together. In a little kind of UFO marimba. And in the day, the UFOs go, go away and everything turns off ready for the next day. Why was this designed? Right? And, and what purpose does it serve? Well, I don't know. I don't fully know. At least I don't fully... I can't fully articulate it, but I want to say this gives my mind somewhere to go. It's, it's, it's a headspace, right? So to wrap up on this series of questioning, which I hope we can all think about together, and uh, as we continue with Artful Design TV over the, over the coming weeks, um, why do we design? You know, is it an economic imperative? Certainly, there's a huge part of it. The whole economy of convenience, well, that is an economic imperative. If you can change people's behavior even just a little bit in a way that they find preferable, you can monetize that. But is this all there is to why we design? Sometimes, to me, there's an aesthetic impulse. Hey, think about that. Like, we, what purpose does that serve, that the square go perfectly into the corner? We rationally all know that it serves no practical purpose, but yet we just want that thing to go in there. Yeah, that's, this is an aesthetic impulse, and I might offer this is no less a valid reason to design, to make things. Because some things we just, there's, this serves no other purpose, and it's just an end in itself. To wrap up, there's, a, there's this principle that begins and ends artful design that says what we make makes us. The things we make not only situate themselves in the world, but they are reflections of who we are. And in a way, like I think this idea of purpose has to be not just an upfront and very signifying, clearly signifying one, but something sometimes, and maybe always, it is more subtle in that there's context and then there's something about how the things we design actually reflect who we are, right? From Ocarina to, to Simone, right? These things reflect us, but also reflects not just the designer, but in a way, all of us. As we grapple with technology, new technology in our lives. For example, the doodling that I cannot control. That's kind of like basically a out of control technology, even though I did not intend for that to happen. That's like technology gone awry, right? Something not for the intended purpose. So why do we design these things? Well, for us in a karma and for us in the VR group, in, in my music computing design group, I think what we work on and why is that we are designing for a kind of flourishing. This is not, this is something that I think in a way sort of captures a part of the why for us. It could be for human flourishing, but maybe it's for just flourishing of, of things. Not just us, but I don't know, our world, which includes humans, but are strictly much more than just us humans. How do we design so we can all flourish? You know, so that's that's the question. So with this, I'm going to pause here before moving to the next segment. Any burning questions? Please feel free to type them in chat. I'm going to wait just a moment. All right. <coughs> so what does all this have to do with our current situation? By the way, if any questions in chat, please type it in Kongwu and we'll uh, find it and then we can... Uh, we can engage with those questions. Um, you know, what does artful design mean in our current circumstances in time of COVID-19, of quarantine, of social distancing, of being virtual? Um, well, I'm gonna go back to the VR lab and and, uh, and we had a me lab meeting yesterday and uh, and there's Jack Atherton right there. Hi, Jack, you're gonna come back for a future part of the show. And, uh, but we talked about a lot of things. And research was probably, is, is a, as it usually goes, is probably the last thing we talked about. We talked about productivity and how it's a strange beast right now, right? The way we, even though we find ourselves on paper with maybe like we're just at home, but we are all in different situations. And even if you don't suddenly find yourself with all the context of being at home and what you need to do at home, 
and depending on kind of your condition at home. Even if you truly have time, as it were, productivity is still, is still weird. But then there are those who are having a lot of, like genuinely a lot of trouble at home. Students, people who, who hold jobs, which now those jobs are in question. Some people have lost their jobs, right? Like what is that, where's this gonna leave us? Well, we don't know, but it seems like, you know, we talked about kind of giving ourselves and others a break. For example, one of my favorite tweets to parents, I don't have any kids, but I, this feels like sound advice. To parents entertaining kids during social distancing and quarantine, if you keep them alive, that is sufficient. Don't feel guilty if you're not like enriching their souls, like doing homeschooling, teach them sign language, engaging their spirits. Toss them some fish sticks, and they'll be fine. Think about that. There's something really, there's a truth to this, to this, right? And it's kind of what I said earlier is that maybe this is a chance of there's it's silver lining to this is all of us can learn to live in some solitude. Even if that solitude means being at home with like two really energetic eight, nine year old kids that's jumping up and down the walls. There's some aspect of, of solitude that I think we were forced to grapple with, but maybe that part of that can be a virtue. And third is this idea that maybe craft and art making for oneself right now it, it may be enough for these times and that this is kind of you know it, like people who make bread for me i've been playing sim city 3000 and just building kind of a version of the city that at least feels like you know some a place for my head to go my version of kind of a of a admittedly fake and very virtual civil society that i construct in a, in a game right um and also to say through activity I think finding a headspace that we can inhabit during these times. And that is artful. And that is perhaps what's, you know, I guess the thing is, these things are always important. So learning to live in solitude, not as a vice, but as a virtue, does, doesn't mean we don't connect with one another. It means that we know how to be alone. And maybe, a, you know, be alone also with other people. But also that kind of activity that we find interesting for its own sake are things that are not necessarily bad things ever to do. And finding this headspace that we can inhabit, well, there's there, that you might just call virtual reality. I mean, is that not VR? It doesn't have a head mounted display necessarily, but it's it's a it's a place for us to inhabit. So with this Let's go to our next group activity. We have just this and one more segment, which is kind of our uh, our crowning segment, which of course is our virtual fireside chat with Anna Shin. Um, and, uh, but before we go there, I wanna share some COVID-19 haikus with you. And I wanna thank uh, my friend Kaiser on Facebook who kind of made this invitation. Give me your best Krona haiku. Remember that a haiku is five syllables, then seven syllables, then five. Astonishing how many people don't get that. Violators will be mercilessly ridiculed. I shall start with one I contributed earlier on Twitter. It's been two weeks now. That have only worn sweatpants. They need to be washed. Other haikus from Will and H. Will we all be fine? Will everybody die? Let's see what happens. Always been distant. Blurry digital students. Now I teach remote. Working from home is nice, but I do feel that I can't be pantless. There's a lot of pants commentary here. I miss hugging folks. Good thing I have my sweet pup, a snuggle monster. Alone together, rooms with the view of a room. Summer is coming. Wow, that one is actually like a haiku. And I'm gonna just share my screen and as we contemplate that last haiku, and I think room with a view of a room, right? I think that's kind of, kind of what this is. Onward, nature respite closed, indoor living exhausting, but could be way worse. Can go to school now. It's so boring to stay home. I wish Chet gone. From Jenny, age eight. Seeking clever twist on Benjamin Franklin's quote, freedom is our rope. Let's think on that one and the many layers it has. 
And finally, back to Kaiser. First thing I'm, I'm going to do after the all clear is work for prison reform. So your homework, if you choose to accept it, optional of course, but recommended, is to express yourself with a poem. This can be, you can start it now, type, type a poem into the chat if you're so inspired, or have it ready for next week or whenever you come back. And COVID haiku, of course, and this particular homework specification was written in the form of a haiku. Kung and I worked hard to uh, bring you this haiku that is also both functional and also follows this particular form of a haiku. It is itself a COVID haiku. So that is your mission if you choose to accept it. Enjoy and have fun when, if you do this, you can do multiple ones and, and uh, feel free to start typing now. And with that, let's actually go to our virtual fireside chat with our special guest, Hannah Shen. Hannah, are you there? Oh. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for joining us on Artful Design TV. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Um, before well, we uh, uh, go ahead. No, no worries. I was going to say before we go to and take a look at a specific uh, work that you've done, and actually let's break it down with the questions we've kind of put a, kind of put forth today. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you, you know design and how you music and how you well how you what is what does all of that mean for you oh that's <laughs> sorry for the big questions yeah that, that's a yeah I, it's kind of hard to find out where to start but um well i've been a yeah yeah i've been a musician all my life um mm -hmm. and then i um i played a piano i got into composing music in college and in stanford i found this really weird oh gosh Sorry, Hannah, I found your web page <laughs> and his link from the archives. In fact, I'm going to break out for now from the screen sharing so right. we can see you more clearly. Um, so when I was in college, um, I joined this weird group called the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. And Go was um, actually one of the founders. But, um, and then through that, I got involved um, into this, in, in this world of music technology and then found out about this whole area of what like music and technology and computers and all these weird things coming together. So that's kind of how I ended up here in the Bay Area, um, being part of the Karma Master's program. And I graduated a few years ago um, and then worked um, at Smule, which um, again, Ge helped found um, the company that makes apps um, for, for music interaction and social, um, social interaction. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, right now I do a lot of different things, um, and my life has kind of like panned out in different ways, but I've always kept sort of this interest in music and just like artful living, artful everything, like having, I've always had a very like aesthetic value in everything that I pursue. So it's, it's a, definitely a question that's very central to me as well. Thank you, Hannah, and uh, and we'll, we'll ask you more about that. But uh, yeah, it seems like we've taken our paths have went through this a lot of the similar points: Princeton to Stanford to Smeal. Um, but what we're going to do now, all of us, is that we're going to actually uh, experience a, a work that can't, Hannah has made. And uh, and for this, I'll give a little bit of background. And I mean, Hannah, you are a you're a, a musician, a composer, a programmer, a designer. Um, a, many other things as you said right uh and in a way like i think what we're about to experience is is that and so we'll ask you about it and we'll open up for questions also afterwards but uh we're going to go ahead and experience i think what hannah and our webpage calls some crazy experimental midi art and i'm going to share my screen all right everyone so give us your critical attention
So Hannah, um, I think you can see from chat that I think we are, we are taken okay. with this. And I think maybe one question that I think seems burning from Kathleen's iPad is, how did you even come up with this, right? And before you answer that, I want to just, again, point out to everyone here kind of some observations about this. And if I may go back into share, screen sharing one more time and to look at this particular, let's just, if, we, if we're just to consider this particular, then we're not gonna listen to it again just yet. But this, of course, is in the shape. This is the MIDI note score right, in Logic or in a similar program that says Harry Potter. And yet, it is also itself a kind of a musical composition that has a trajectory, that has a form, that has a narrative, that has rises and falls and a climax. And yet, it is strictly adhering to kind of the overall kind of logo, visual logo of Harry Potter. And so, yeah, so here's the you know, maybe that's the question to start with, Hannah, is how did you even come up with this? Mm. You know, <laughs> it, it's, I'm sure everyone's had this experience where it's, it's not necessarily something you might like plan, like this is what I'm going to do and then go and do, but then it just kind of comes out. And so like it, the, the whole process was a live process for me too. And that being said, I did start out with a few parameters and that really helped. Um, so I, I started off with the intention that I'm gonna draw the Harry Potter logo and I'm gonna use the colors, I'm gonna use the notes um, to play the Harry Potter songs and express that within that um, sort of artificial constraints. Um, so it, it was just kind of a perfect coincidental like setup that I made for myself to kind of let this creative juices flowing. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of times like it's very hard to just like start something like with a blank piece of paper like when you don't have any constraints like okay go go compose a piece of music about I don't know Harry Potter or something and then a lot of times you know I, I just draw a blank and like okay what am I supposed to do so in this case it really I gave myself those artificial constraints of okay here's what I'm gonna like here's the the limitations I can do I can make with the notes and within those I'm gonna try and make it work and once that was kind of there the parameters are there um, it actually helped me to just kind of go with that and see what I can do with each step and then um, it was very much like a sculpting process where maybe you start out and um, carve out like the bigger chunks and then you go and refine the little parts and then you like look at it from a different angle and then you go and fix different things. So like um, over multiple iterations of going back and forth and also um, slowly moving from beginning to end um, sort of came together at the end. Did you, I mean, I've so many times that I and also like my students have, have looked at this in class and tried to reverse engineer your process and feel like, how could this have been done? Like a, as a critical exercise, right? And thank you for explaining mm -hmm. explaining that. I mean, it's, it seems like for me, I, like I've, I also know that you, you do, you play piano and you, uh, you do a lot of improvisation. I've heard you play, you, you play beautifully. And, and in a sense, like the style of music that we hear here seems something that was very reminiscent of in my of you playing the piano when you were improvising in that particular style. And it felt like that gave you freedom within the constraints mm -hmm. to actually shape the, you know, to actually shape the music. I mean, is that, am I, are, are yeah. we close? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a large part of it was pretty much, it was, you know, just done by, um, like really sticking with my ear and what, what, what I was hearing, what I, what that felt like. And if it didn't feel right, then going and like kind of fumbling around or reaching for the thing that, that sounds oh, like that's it. And so that's why I'm saying it's, it's like a iterative process. You, you, um, 
maybe I put in a few notes to make the shape and then play it out and then it, it sounds weird. Okay, like if I, what if I move it here? What if I move it here? And then like, it just kind of comes together um, in, in my own style because that's kind of the, the sound that I'm looking for in my head. So did you, did you do all of that basically with your mouse and keyboard or were there moments where you're inputting things using like um, just actually playing a musical keyboard? That was all by mouse. Yeah. Oh, mouse wow. and keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because it was, it, the process was very much driven by the visual aspect of it, which is very different from how I usually compose. You know, I, I usually just play everything. I have to play it physically. Um, and then I moved the notes, but then this one, because I had that visual constraint to, from the get go. Um, so like in the beginning, maybe I'll lay out the, the bigger structure, like the letter P. Um, and then I, I would actually look at the, what the logo looks like and kind of try to draw it with the notes, just kind of put in placeholder MIDI notes in there. And then, you know, obviously it sounds terrible when you play it. <laughs> it's like, a bunch of things like boom, boom, dun, 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 dun. Like, you know, it just sounds super random. So, but that's what you start with. And then within that framework, um, you like, if you look at it, um, if you kind of look at the, the individual notes and stuff, um, there is actually a lot of space within each letter that you can play with. So that's where the artistic expression can come out and you can put in the melody, you can put in the counter melodies and the bass line and everything. Fantastic. Um, I think <laughs> this is actually a good point for us to open up the floor for questions on chat and, uh, and <laughs> excuse me, we can wait a few moments, see if anyone has any other questions. Um, um, there was a question, are the colors velocity? Yeah, the color was velocity. So I did cheat a few times um, where there were just, there was just like no way around it. And I put in like a really long bass note, like super, super quiet. So it didn't really like add to the sound, but it was there visually. But I tried to minimize that as much as possible. And then we have a, another question. Is it possible to perform the Harry Potter piece and has it been performed? Performed it. What does it mean to perform? The like, Harry I mean, piece? perhaps perform it live. Oh. <laughs> I think I might need like six more hands. <laughs> but it, it could be possible, yeah. yeah. Um, and also, and here's a question, and maybe tell us a bit more about kind of what you're working on now. And uh, for example, here you might be working on a podcast. Yeah, I saw the question about that. Um, yeah, so the podcast, um, so, <laughs> well, yeah, my, my life has been very, yeah, after I graduated from Karma, and then I went to Smule, and then I, I left a few years ago, it, it's, taken a very interesting turn and I've, I've explored in many different areas and um, you know I was I was into farming for a bit I, um, I started a new career as a massage therapist um, I got into martial arts and then I've been doing a lot of just like deep self reflection um, and like self development work kind of thing and so I, I recently started a podcast um, as kind of a crystallization of some of my musings and also like my effort to like transmit that and to like put it out there um, to for anybody who's interested and also for myself to just like be able to express myself in that way. And so I started a podcast called Soul Prints, um, Soul Prints, just one word. And um, it, I, I treat it much like an art project as much as it is about like personal musings and about my life. So it's, it's kind of everything coming together for me. So I, I definitely incorporate music and I talk about some of my reflections, like stories from daily life and just kind of what, what's been on my mind, where um, I think it all leads <laughs> for me, sort of. So it's, it's been like an avenue for me to like find meaning in, in my own life and to sort of put my tentacles out, out to the world to like connect in a different way that I haven't before. So, yeah. 
what would be the best way for uh, for us to find and to access the, the podcast? Uh, it, it's just, it's on um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Um, I don't know if it's on Google, Stitcher. Yeah. If you just look up Soul Prince podcast, you can find it. And I actually just released a new episode today, fourth one. So. And Kung Wu has also put the URL to the podcast in the uh, in, in the chat window for those who want to open that in your browser by clicking on that link. Cool, um, and one more thing, if I may, uh, actually, you know, I, I notice, so I'm going to go back to sharing the screen once again. And if, with your permission, Hannah, I'm go back to your web page. <laughs> That's okay. Because <Okay. laughs> there's a lot of good stuff on it. Um, actually, let me see. The, so, one week, actually, there's also a good time to talk to you about the Artful Design TV archive. If you go to the archive, we're going to archive each episode here. And we're going to have our special guest each week or guests each week. And we're going to have a link to kind of the information. Let me know if there's a better website to link to, but this one links to your now Kama I have to website. My website. <laughs> and, but in, even on here, there's so much stuff to look at, right? Compositions, performance, experiments. And for example, MIDI art, this, you did another one for Pikachu. Uh, yeah. This is, for example, this is on YouTube. And by the way, if you follow this link here and I advise you, I mean, look at this. As, this is only 2,657 views. How is this not like viral? Like how does it not have 2 million views, right? People need to know how awesome this is. And of course, everyone that's seen it, you know, it's like 180 to zero. Right. And in fact, look at the first comment from a year ago. I don't think most people understand what a colossal effort and amount of talent it takes to do this. This should have a lot more views and likes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Remarkable. So if you like this, I, I just, not even for Hannah's sake, even though I do hope for Hannah's sake that more people see this, I think just for, if you love this and things like this, you know, send this to your friends send this to your family so that they can see this and be like, that's awesome. Right. And I think in a way I, it serves a dual purpose. Um, so I'm going to call that out. And, uh, um, so I guess Hannah, um, go back to stop sharing. So any more questions for Hannah and, uh, see some people have already subscribed to your podcast. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions for Hannah while we have her here? Uh, I think there's a question. I think what was the software tool or tools that you use to make this particular piece? It was just Logic, um, Logic Pro 9, I believe. Yeah, I'm actually like wanting to find more or like better medium for this kind of stuff. Like I kind of had to come up with my own setup of like re screen recording and then like putting the the whole screen at the bottom and stuff like that, but I'm sure there's better ways to do it. <laughs> I think one more question from Zia Panda. If you, if you like to answer, you see that, Anna? I'm sorry? You see this one, given your quest for meaning, are you seeing ways in which in design uh, or designing our group creativity can be used to fight the mm -hmm. virus or current situ situation? Yeah, what's the yeah, role I mean, of... I I think it's the same thing that you you were getting at before is that, um, you know, there is certainly survival and then the, the necessary needs of, you know, eating and going to the bathroom, like, you know, health and those kinds of things. But but even health, you know, there's so much, it, it's a multidimensional thing and we need a community, we need, you know, good company touch and um, eventually, and it, so, and, and I think things like art and being able to come together and make making making do with what we have in creative ways, just like like this meeting right now, I think that's that's one way for us to not only survive, survive well, but also to flourish and to thrive. And I think that's really what makes us um, human and makes us, um, I guess, worth existing in this world. So that, that's really what I believe in. So, thank you for this thank opportunity. Thank you so much, Hannah. That's, could not think of a better end to, uh, to both our fireside chat and, and really the, the conclusion of this very first 
episode, as it were, of uh, Artful Design TV. Thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us, and thank you for being awesome. Uh, what we just saw was just one of, in fact, everyone, if you would, find the hand clapping uh, in under oh, participants, if you like. And uh, if you like, let's, let's uh, <coughs> give, Hannah, give Hannah a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and we hope to have you back in a future time. There's so much you've done that we could talk about. And, uh, sure, I'd, so, be, I'd be happy to. Thank you. And also check out her podcast. Um, By the way, um, somebody asked earlier, this is Fred behind me. He's a skeleton. He's my dance partner and my um, exercise buddy at the moment. <laughs> but, yeah. Hi, Fred. So in conclusion, then, um, I'm going to once more share my screen. If one of these days, I'll, I'll get hopefully fast, faster and better at this. Um, so I think this is kind of what we have for today. I just want to acknowledge and also call for just your feedback. Um, acknowledgements to my co-organizer and co-host, um, Kung Wu, uh, to Farron from Stanford Video for helping me really work through all the technical details um, and really like leveled me up in terms of how to do this Zoom series well from a technical and also kind of just from like, how do we run this, right? And I uh, really want to thank Farron and also, of course, Thank you, Hannah, for being our special guest in this inaugural uh, episode of Artful Design TV. And also thanks to everyone who's joined. Um, and I really appreciate, and I think this is, a, this is a time for us to find different ways of connection. And please do help us improve. And on that note, um, if you go to kind of this, the link where you followed to get here, um, there at the bottom is to give us feedback this will take you to a Google form where you put the episode date and just tell us what anything you want, but certainly like how we might improve. Uh, nothing's too big and nothing's too small. So please give us your critical feedback. Um, and also the archive will be live here, but already right now you can get to Hannah's Karma webpage. And from there, I think you can get to a lot of our other work. I just want to put that out there. And uh, with that, uh, this is Artful Design TV. We'll see you next Wednesday at 1 p.m. California time. As always, you can find everything from this URL, artful.design slash TV. And before signing off, I'm just going to start this video one more time for one more group dance. It's 30 seconds. And uh, thank you all for joining. And stay well, stay healthy, stay artful. All right, are we ready for this? One more time with feeling. so much Hello. and uh, this is it see you guys next week rock on stay well stay safe stay artful goodbye